Thank you so much. Really, thank you for the invitation. I'm so excited to share what we are doing recently. Yeah, and then I think I have the hard task to be like effective after the lunch break. But if you are like tired, just lie over there. I will not, I will not mind. Okay, so something about you, uh, about myself. You introduced me very nicely, but also uh, like about my story through the science. I was doing many topics, and finally I arrived uh, in the topic what I'm doing about this living coating system. But you can see I was dealing with so many different topics, and I think this is like really nice to to do, to to take the science as, as as adventure. And then I also want to mention that I'm recently working in Slovenia, so it's the only country which has love in the name. So and I'm really love to do science. So. OK, so uh, talking about myself, I'm merging two disciplines because I'm biologist and also material science scientist. So this is like, you know, the nice uh, disciplines which is possible to merge nowadays because we are all talking about the inter interdisciplinary, pluridisciplinarity was like the innovative you know, was like talking about that. And about the evolution, I was telling about my evolution, but talking about the humans, we are like relatively new species on the earth. We are like 300,000 years here, but definitely we like to build and create and we like to build big. And what we are doing is like we are producing and we are developing, but as a result, we are producing 10 billion of ton of concrete every, every year. So it's a huge number. And talking about the plastic is 300 million tons of plastic every year. And some of this is ending up in the oceans. So of course, it's like the, we are like harming a bit of our environment. And then we arrive to the point when we, when the human made up materials, including concrete, metal, plastic, bricks, and asphalt, uh, exceeded overall living biomass on earth. So I think this is like really something which is like, uh, is good to have in the mind when we are talking about the circular economy and sustainability. And then we already see the effects of that. So yeah, we, we all think about the global climate change, but it's really happening. Therefore, we are all as Innova Wood also switching to the circular economy, sustainability, and we would like to use more wooden products. And I, I, this is absolutely great. And we do so. But the question is, are all the building materials, sustainable building materials are really truly sustainable and environmentally friendly? And when we think about the materials, it's like so many like the resin and organic treatments and so on. So you can see like it's, we are thinking about the performance during the service life, but not always we are thinking about the end of life and then about the read closing the circle. And then what we can do, we can also look at the nature because in nature, the things are like uh, really upcycle and recycle and there is no really waste. And then why nature is always nice to learn from somebody who has more experience. So, so <laughs> during the 3.6 billion of years of evolution, we really we can benefit from that. And since we are relatively old, uh, young here on the planet. And then how is the nature solving some issues? So 96% of, of, the, of the materials is made just from four elements, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen. So it's very, very simple. Uh, the nature is using resources in the cycle loop, so it's like circular economy, it's like done already. <laughs> and the waste from another uh, organism become nutrients for another, so it's cascade use, it's like, it's there. And then the ro role te term uh, release of the toxic emissions is rare, and then the processes are done on the ambient temperature without high pressure, so it's like much more, uh, much less energy uh, demanding. And then the structure are done in the hier hierarchical way, so they have different properties on different levels. But all of this is very simple, functional and reliable. So more simple the solutions are, the most robust they are, they are at the end. And then if you think about the biological system, there are two different, two different characteristics which are like very relevant. They are multifunctional, but they are also highly optimized. And then you can say, like, uh, is the bio inspiration or imitation, in, in, uh, inspiration, imitation, and then yeah, it like, doesn't matter really because we can take the the, the solution as, as they are and we can all directly mimic them. I can also use my photo. My daughter is saying that I'm lo lo looking like this when I'm talking. So it doesn't matter really if you are do doing exactly the transformation what is in the nature or you are just taking this as a as a sort of inspiration. It's, it's just to just to look as, as something which we can explore. And the system created in nature can be used for really for uh, solving a lot of concept materials and solutions. And started with Leonardo, 
but not that one, with that one, with Leonardo da Vinci, who was like really good observer and created already so many nice uh, um, developments in the terms of engineering. So the the the, the bio inspiration is not really new new stuff. It started. People were like already humans were observing the nature and taking the best already in the past. But the really cool thing is the bio inspiration can really innovate so many different disciplines. So the things which are created in the nature can can inform the development of new new materials. Then the way to, uh, the the natural organization can inform potential shape or or man, man materials. The way organisms perceive can uh, can be inspiration for new de development of new sensors. The the way of uh, when the plants or animals are moving can inform the advances in mechanics or kinetics. Then the way or uh, the organisms are interacting can inspire new way of con communication. And the, finally, the, the way the living organisms perform can inf inspire new processes. So it's a really broad portfolio of the, of the inspiration you can take. And it's already done. Some things are already done. The Kingfisher was inspiration for the Shinkansen train, like the, the shape. And the, the skin of the shark was inspiration for making the swimming suit, which allows to swim faster and to have this, like the high, high speed uh, swimming. And uh, also the geckos, hence, like uh, inspire the, the climbing adhesive. So it's already done. But if you think about the materials, the, in general, there are like the three classes. So we can have the, you can, we can use the biomimicry for the inspiration of the materials which are reacting, which are acting to the external stimuli. They can rearrange the shape and they can reform, reformulate, or we can also talk about the surface modification. But can we do, go beyond of that? Can we do, do something more? And if we think about the nature, nature has so many self-properties, like self-growth, self-adaptability, self-assembling or self-healing. And the question is, what if materials with this characteristic could be made? And can you imagine new applications which are possible if we are having this principle embedded for materials development? So then it comes this engineering living materials which are materials which are composite of living cells, and then they're like allowing new functionalities which are not uh, uh, explored for the conventional materials. So finally, you are bringing the new dimension which is not existing beside of the dimensions. You are bringing also life to materials, which is, I think, pretty cool. And then if we think about the properties, you have the living cells, you are inspired by the nature uh, regarding the phenomena of adaptation and so on. And you can imagine plenty of nice functionalities, which is like really incredible. So they can solve so many issues. And if you think about this functionality is in terms of the building environment, you can see our houses, future houses, they can do so much more than just being static, static materials, static elements. And if you would like to read a bit more, it was just like the, my paper was published in Nature Reviews and it's in the June, uh, June issues, so it's like recently <laughs> uh, available. So it's, it's really a lot of a lot of different potentials is open if we think about this in terms of materials. And then coming to the to the topic which I'm exploring now, I'm working with the coatings, architectonical coatings, which are um, meant to protect surface, different surface. It's not only wood, and of course the, my heart is close to wood, but I'm also working with the protection of concrete, of stone and plastic and bricks and, and metal and so on. And then architectural co uh, coatings are en 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 enhancing the performance and then it's like so uh, so big market on that. And then also in terms of the liters, it's like 50 billions of liters is hard to imagine, but this is the the amount of 16,000 Olympic swimming pools or better the amount of beer which is consumed in Europe every year. So it's like you can imagine how many liters of coatings are produced. So it's quite a big market. And of course, coatings are, are exposed to the weathering and the, the weathering process is affecting all of them. And they are performing, sometimes performing badly independent on the surface they're supposed to protect. So it's not just that they're failing on wood, but they're also failing on concrete, on stone and so on. You can see the results. And what we do, we are adding some biocides, mineral oils, synthetic chemicals, but then we have the issue of the formulation, which becomes toxic and not environmentally friendly. And then with the Archiskin, we would like to revol revolutionize this approach. We would like to propose something which will be living. So we are pushing the boundaries of the materials engineering toward living, smart living surfaces. 
And then our coatings uh, like, are meant to possess nice properties such as bioremediation and self-healing. I will talk about that later. And they are also meant to work on different, um, in the, in, on different substrates and on, in different climates. And how we are going to do that? We are working with the biofilm. So this is this is biofilm which you have on your teeth. So if you didn't brush, you have the, the thicker layer. But the biofilms are like the, the most stable systems on the earth. And this doesn't mean that I would like to apply the plaque from the teeth on the on the on the concrete or stone, but it's just the experience just to show you. Then the biofilms are really robust system, which are created by nature. And usually this is like the composition of, of different microorganisms, can be bacteria, can be fungi, usually it's the mixture. They are very robust, they are producing the APS and they are like much more resistant than the single cells. So we are trying to engineer the biofilm for protection of the of different building materials. And then, so this approach is rare because usually people are thinking, okay, let's get rid from the biofilm. So it's like the in the hospitals, for example, they are like uh, sterilizing the things, which is like, okay, is the, is the practice, but doesn't really work when we are talking like with the bacteria and putting antibi antibiotics because always there will be one which will survive and make it stronger. So I think it's much more efficient to use the nature against the nature. So, and then, so we are using, we would like to use the biofilm for the protection of the materials, which is uh, not the conventional way with the, with the, with the research dealing with the biofilm. And to do so, we are using fungi. And then fungi are really fascinating. We had some fungi yesterday on the dinner. And then you can see the gorgonzola cheese. We are eating some fungi. They are bioluminescent fungi. If you are like less creative, you can always eat halogenogenic fungi to have this better thinking. But yeah, the fungi are like really nice group, which is like 120,000 uh, of species are identified, but there's so much things to explore. So we are exploring them. And then, and we are working on the fungal biofilm, which is like quite robust and has so many properties which are like making it perfect candidate for the protection. So I would not read that, but yeah, in, indeed the fungal biofilm is something what, uh, what we identify as a potential way to, to prevent the deterioration of building, building materials. And our candidate is Aerobasidium pullulans, and then we selected this for the reason because it's ubiquitous, it's living in different environments, which means in the, our coating has the potential to, to be effective in different climates. You can find Aerobasidium in, in deserts, you can find on the glacier, so the coatings can be used in different, in different locations. It's poly tolerant, so it's like really surviving high, high temperature and can be in the hibernation state and can regrow. So it means it's like even there is like some uh, like a stop for the for the reproduction, it can it can regenerate and regrow. Has very high phenotypic plasticity, so has has five modes of grow and is easily switching from one to another. So this is like really uh, interesting phenomena. Has broad enzymatic profile, so it means can digest many different nutrients and we can feed them. We can make the target feeding and it will be like really. Uh, growing in the way we would like to have it, has brought in pigmentation, so it produces different pigments by, by itself, but we can also enhance the color with the structural color, and it's not toxic, so mix the, the perfect combination for, the, for our case. And then our methodology, so we are using the design, build, test, learn approach, and the project started in September, so we're really at the beginning, so I will show you some results from the phased phase, when it's like the exploration, we are trying to understand the biofilm structure which is naturally occurring. Then there is the designing of the coating system, which will come a bit later. And then we are uh, we, we are planning to, to evaluate the performance. So the results I will show you is from the first one, but I hope it's like we are progressing quite, quite nicely. Okay, so talking about the ongoing experiments, we were working on the bioreceptivity, so the attractiveness of the materials for the colonization, for the natural colonization. So we have some uh, experiments ongoing and then we are swapping different materials and we are like um, making the DNA identification and then we are also uh, analyzing the, the fungi with the micro, uh, uh, multi-mode microplate reader to, to see the cell growth, to see the the signaling, so the, how the tangi are talking. I'm five years in Slovenia, but I didn't manage to learn Slovenia, but I'm now learning the new language. This is like fungi le learning, is the chemical signaling. 
And then we already found that there are several species uh, on the present on the on the materials, but our aerobatidium is quite common, which is a good sign because it's naturally occurring. So our role is to identify it and to make it even more happy and more robust, so it will be uh, willing to protect the materials in our on our uh, rules. Then we are in the, investigating the surface and then we are doing it in the conventional way with the optical microscope with the com colony counter, but we are also using the high throat wood methodology like the hyperspectral and multispectral imaging. So we are screening the materials and just to seeing that the, how is the growth and then uh, what are the best um, parameters which are stimulating the growth and branching and so on. Then we are like, uh, when we are cultivating the fungi, it's like really just to see the growth is something, but you need to have some days when they will be like able to, you will be able to see this on the microscope. But the microcalorimetry is allowing us to see this growth really at the very, very beginning. So we are testing our, our fungi, we are stressing them, giving some nutrients, and we, we can see um, uh, enzymatical like the, the activity, and we can see uh, we can measure this this in terms of the heat which is generated by the cells. So this is really really beginning of the growth. We are able to to monitor that. So you can see like already some results regarding the microcalorimetry. Then of course it's important to feed the fungi. We would like the, the fungi will not degrade our material, but it will will be protecting the material. So we have to feed the, 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 the fungi. And then I was mentioning then has broad enzymatic profile, so has a lot of enzymes which are able to degrade materials, but we are would like to provide the food which is like the easy to digest. And to do that, we are using molecular docking. So it's the same way we are designing the drugs in the in the medicine. We are like having the, the drug and we have having the, the receptor and it's perfect matching. So in case we are doing this, we'll be sure then the, the fungi is not degrading the materials itself, the surface, just eating what we are giving to it. And then we are doing this in the collaboration with the colleagues from UP. And then also what is like uh, really Im like important and relevant is the time of uh, my microscopy. So we'd like to see the progress of the growth and it's not just like one moment where we are imaging the materials, but we are observing this in the long term. So we are playing with different stains and then with different dyes, fluorescent dyes, and trying to, to see the progress. And then it's like very important to us to see how is the branching and like the, the apical grow or like there is an anastomosis. So it's just like connections and they're like able to survive and so on. And to do so, we are also implementing mathematical modeling because it's like, okay, it's something which to have the images, but we are transforming this with the computer vision and having some mathematical models. And I'm working closely with the colleagues from the IT department and then trying to, to understand these interactions and then trying to optimize the nutrients to, just to make our fungi happy and robust and big and covering the surface. So it's like the different uh, approach we are trying to implement, we are testing now that the, the the algorithm and then just to have them better insights but uh, what i hear from my colleagues they are like pretty like they are it guys so very like specific and focused on the on the work but they they found the fungi also quite interesting because what they can discover in mycelium they can use for the optimization of the transport or some other stuff so it's like the so just to think about this was like the brief like the overview what we are doing now for this few months but of course, there is a lot of challenges ahead of us, like because like the, we are dealing with materials which are alive. So we have to really understand like if there are like some any constraints and then the biological, physical, how they are, the the fungi are the, the 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 cells are propagating, if they are like robust, if they are dying, if they are surviving, and so on. So it's like a, a lot of different aspects we don't we are not really considering when we are designing the materials in the conventional way. Then we have to keep our material our our candidate alive. So this is also something which is uh, important to know. That's why we are selecting the fungi, which is like the extremo polytolerant, so can survive different different uh, climates, the high temperature, low low nutrients level, low moisture level, and so on. Then we have new fabrication technology. So our is quite easy, is the coating, but there are also bio inks with the living cells and then for the uh, used for the 3D printing. So the still the, 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 the cells should supposed to ar uh, arrive, uh, uh, survive, and then to be able to, to penetrate the, the, the materials and to be able to reproduce. Then what is working in the lab doesn't have to work in the in the real case. So is the upscaling is another issue, which is usually like uh, 
is still ahead of us, but we are considering like because we have the smaller reactor, seven liters. Okay, if we'll be able to 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 produce the coating like in several liters batches, doesn't mean that it will be successful in 50 liters batches and so on. So it's another story. Then uh, to arrive to that, it's like really we need to be open mind and uh, like in my group, I have 11 people from 10 different countries, but I have chemists, physicists, material scientists, biologists, microbiologists, and we try to approach this in the interdisciplinary way to to be open mind for some solutions which are not really obvious sometimes for us if we're like so bended to some 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 um, uh, some solutions. Then the safety issue, of course, we are dealing with materials which are alive, so they have to be safe for the for the customers and then there is no sterilization for such things so okay this is like the tier level is like quite slow three four but we will arrive to that one but then if we would like to really think about the market there will be some standardization needed and finally people would like to uh, supposed to accept this material so this is another aspect we will be foreseeing at the end of the project just to just to convince the customer then this could be the solution. But I guess it will be maintenance free if the fungi will regrow and maybe this will be the, the option. So that's from my side. And then so the biomimicry can really make the inspiration. And then what I, I believe then the, the, the nature already has so many nice solutions. So it's, our role is to observe and to translate this for our application. Okay, that's from my side. If there will be any question, we'll be happy to answer them. There are really high demands on surface properties, color, etc. What makes you think that you will ever fulfill such high demands, yeah. or, or don't you want to fulfill them? That's maybe another. I would like uh, to fulfill, of course. Like <laughs> the, the 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 color, like the the basic color for azobasidium pululan is the black because it has the melamine, which is like the naturally protecting against the UV radiation. But there are stains which produce the the pink, the the yellowish color, and so on. And then our approach is to use different the different um, strains which are like uh, taken from different environment and try to make them robust. But the plan B is to use the structural color uh, in the formulation, which means then uh, the, the structural color is not based on the pigments. It's just the matter of the ref reflection of the of the light with the with the small particles which will be embedded. And this will be like enhancing the color which is produced by the fungi itself. So I think we will be arriving to the to different coloration. I didn't promise this in the pro in the project. I was I was focusing on the black, uh, which was like the basic. But I had the plan B in my head, and we already like starting to do this color. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, I, I think it's very interesting when you have a lecture where you say that you're keeping your fungi happy. Uh, it's not very often that uh, you, you hear this, but uh, the question is: uh, Have you managed to keep your fungi happy? So far, yes, but it's like it's, it's small scale, but we are feeding them well, really like <laughs> we are feeding them well. And then uh, at the end, the, um, it's not that difficult, I would say, because uh, we are like so spoiled and we go to, for the catering and we try this and that. But in nature, it's much more simple. They just go for the nutrients, which is the easiest digestible for them. So if in case we have this solution, they will not touch something which is much which needs much more energy to 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 digest. They will go for the simple one. So, yeah, happy fungi, happy fungi yes, yes. Yeah, hello, and um, Steve Bordage from uh, Rice. And I, I in the past I was uh, <coughs> working with the all basidium pululans and, and surface coatings and, and so on. And uh, it's interesting because <coughs> our basidium is always seen as the the problem. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> so everybody wants to, uh, at that time, wanted to uh, be sure that the arbasidium wouldn't uh, grow on the surface of the coating or penetrate the coating mm -hmm. and reach the wood and so on. There are, have been some similar uh, wor work done some years ago with vegetable oils mm -hmm. that they grow the, the fungi before, so they deliver the, the pieces of wood already colonized. Yeah, and so. In this way, uh, 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 the objective here is to to deliver something that is going to happen after application on, on the surface. Yeah. The, 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 I'm aware of all this work, what you cited, and then like, I'm working with Michael Seiler from Silo, and then we are working on this system or so, like on the other bases. 
Yes, and then the, so of course the, the, in the formulation they will be leaving cells, and then the the coating it's is working a bit different way in different way than the conventional coating, which are the best performing if you are just apply, and then with the time is going to be worse. In our case, we are applying different layers, very thin layers, and the 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 the, um, the coating is getting better in time because it needs some some cooling, and from the if this, if this is natural process, is 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 growing better if it's exposed to the UV. Which is producing the enhancing the production of the melamine and so on. Yes, but it's the the idea is to to have it uh, in the in the robust way, like the uniform way. I, I'm aware about the, the 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 molds which are like in the the worst if they are in the patchy way. Sometimes yes, sometimes not, and it's making this material so uni ununiform. Yeah. But in case we'll be able to produce the engineered biofilm which is entirely covering the surface, I think there is no issue then because they will be like covering everything, so it's, they will regrow. And just one, one last thing, you said that uh, maintenance free. Do you think that uh, you have to <clears throat> maybe um, reapply some type of uh, nutrient formulation and so on, so it keeps living? Or? Yeah, this is the, this is the the case. But the, everything what what could be reapply is like a, I think is the, there are like different stories with the porous and not porous materials because on porous we can already impregnate, so it will be like you know some long term release, and then we can reapply another layer of most likely linseed oil or some oils because the like the lipase is one of the predominant enzymes, so it could be like this way. The most uh, problematic are are not porous materials which is like steel and metal so then we have to embed the nutrients already in the formulation and then it, to make it this like long term release so i think this is another challenge but we like challenges so yeah. okay i think in that we will pass to another speaker today we will thank you anna